Okay, we're back. We're live at 2 o'clock block. We have Larry Gr Grimm. Grimm. G-R-I-M-M. And um, he's going to be a host of a show, and we're sort of initiating that show today. It's called Elderhood. Okay, and he's a chaplain at the uh, Bristol Hospice. So he has learned a lot about, about aging and dying, for that matter. Yes. From his work. So we're calling this show, Does Life Begin at Elder, Elderhood? And uh, the tagline is aging one day at a time. The whole thing is about aging and aging in grace. So I call this the takeaway is aging is an art form and aging in grace is the best way to go. Larry, do you agree with that? I totally agree with that. <laughs> Excellent, Jay. Thank you so much, first of all, for having me on the show today. And sure. for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to engage people in their, in their own life decisions and to help coach a little bit what it's like to go through elderhood. And each person is different. So um, you're an Episcopal minister, and you come at this from, I guess, a religious point of view, but you don't seem to be a religious person to me. You seem to be more practical and philosophical and kind. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I know those things are not necessarily uh, thank you for inconsistent the with religion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, over, the, over the many years of my service, I've been in the Presbyterian Church as a minister in various congregations. Presbyterian, sorry. Yeah, and I've enjoyed all the congregations, and they all, all have had elder people in them, of course, and more so now because there are fewer and fewer young people that, that are entering into churches in a I'm going to join the church kind of fashion. So I've been accustomed to elders, um, and now... I am one. <laughs> <laughs> You're not only speaking for yourself, you know. <laughs> That's right. So um, for me, my, uh, my faith tradition and my faith experience sensitizes me to other people. And as a professionally trained chaplain, uh, I'm particularly interested and trained to listen to people where they're at, whatever their tradition is. Everyone lives in their own tradition and mythology. And whatever that mythology is for them, it's, it makes, helps them make sense of life, helps them to get in touch with that reality beyond this reality. It helps them to go through life. And I want to be a partner with them in that, in that journey. Well, you know, the thing is, you can go through your life and still be on automatic. You, know, you can be on what your parents taught you and what your friends and teachers taught you. And you never really have to do anything introspective. You, you, you know, you get a job, you stay with a job, you, you go through, you're automated. Okay, but when you face, you know, dramatic changes in your life or dying, um, then you really have to start thinking about these things. As you said, you have to make sense of it for yourself. You have to come to, to grips, come to peace um, with, you know, the, your basic understanding of the world and yourself. And that requires more than the average workday experience. I agree, Jay. And so often, um... And I, I can speak as a professional church person, too. So often church people think, I mean, the professional church person will say, here, I have the answers for you. But that doesn't enable the person to struggle on their own and to find out, what, is, what do I claim for myself? What works for me in terms of, of uh, belief systems, in terms of making, making meaning of my life in my context? So. Um, for me, that's, that's, that's the big thing, enabling people to make meaning in their own context of their life. What and, I get out of it is so interesting is you speak about you helping them understand themselves, but in so doing, you also are helping us understand you or helping yourself understand you. Exactly. Because this is your chosen avocation. Exactly. This is your chosen way to spend your time on the planet. No? Exactly. <laughs> I get so much more. What, what I get more than they do in some ways. We can always say the teacher learns more. Yeah, yeah, it's sure, a very rewarding should. experience. Very rewarding. And uh, working as a chop, uh, ch uh, hospice chaplain, um, one of the things I've learned to do, or hope I l am learning to do, is to walk in the room and say, with the attitude, you're teaching me what it's like to be you in this situation. Hi in this bed, dying. in this moment of dying, in this moment of letting go of this life or something else, whatever it may be. So I'm, I'm really wanting to go in, Jay, uh, and I appreciate you picking that up, open to what people can teach me 
And how you spend your time. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, one, it's one thing, may you suggest, you can disagree. It's one thing to be a, a minister mm -hmm. and a chaplain for that matter. It's another thing to be a chaplain in a hospice. Um, because you have to face this and you have to help, help other people face it. And in so doing, you begin to understand the common threads about how people react at this point in life. Good point. And one of the, one of the things that I've, I've uh, heard said is that where the, doc when the doctor says we can do nothing else, that's where we come in. The hospice begins. The hospice begins to say, by saying, we're here to help you die in a peaceful and comfortable manner, and help the family move through that as well. Um, Alan Watts, back in the 1990s, uh, said, a philosopher said, uh, we need more people that will help us die splendidly. Yeah. Well, you know, and the alternative is bleak. But before we get to the alternatives of dying splendidly, yeah. Uh, can we talk about the bell curve in Hawaii? Can we talk about the stats here? Okay. Uh, what, what do we have in terms of an aging population? You mentioned before the show that, um, you know, as a, a part, of, part of the pie, so to speak, of stats, we have more uh, people in the aging process here than anywhere in the country. How that's, does that work? That's what I've read, and I don't have the stat in mind right now exactly, but I've read that we uh, here in Hawaii have the highest number of aging, and I'm going to assume that's over 55, highest number of aging population in the, in the uh, United States. So it means that people are growing up here, dying here, or moving here to die, but I, I will tell you I'm amazed at the number of patients that we have in Bristol who have been born on the island, and they're dying on the island. I mean, I've had people, I asked a patient the other day, when did you come to the island? And she said, I'm born here in her 90 degree, I mean, 90, 90 year old, uh, uh, very sophisticated manner, very elegant manner, but, you know, very proud of it. So here are people who have, many people who have just made their place here years ago or were born here and they're, they're dying here now well, and as some, well. Some few, and I, I know one, have never left Oahu in their lives. Yeah, I'm serious about that. This yeah. is this is their home. They don't need to go anywhere else. But you know, one of the things that that happens now in our changing times is it's it's harder to, you know, develop a retirement where you can feel comfortable <clears throat> because rents go up. You may not own any property. Um, you know, there are more issues, and there will be in the future more issues about health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, mm -hmm. all that, Social Security. Who knows where it's going to go? And some people who worked a hard middle-class life all their lives um, are in trouble in their yeah. retirements. Yeah. And the older they get, the more in trouble they get. And, uh, you know, it's, it's tragic, especially in Hawaii, that the, the old days in which they lived, uh, you know, in uh, Ohana housing, um, and uh, their families were around to take care of them. Yeah. In the nuclear Hawaii, everybody goes to the mainland, and maybe yeah. the kids aren't here anymore, and uh, they got a problem in finding a a soft place, the, the older people. And they can go to the mainland and join their kids, but sometimes they, they, their friends are here. Absolutely. They don't want to leave. Absolutely. So what you have is uh, you have some elderly people who are living longer because of modern medicine and because of well, many factors, um, but who are not living as well as they might have expected to live. And so they're unhappy. And that's got to be a big problem in Hawaii. I'm sure you've seen that. It absolutely is. And we have about... Um, we spend most of our medical money over for the age of over age of sixty five. So if you're over the age of sixty five, you need about eight thousand dollars a year. You're looking at that as medical costs in a senior facility or just medical, just medical costs in general. But the majority of those expenses are the facility. Uh, facilities cost more for the sixty five and older. And anything else, we're talking about medical care mm. and medicines and such, but but it's the facilities that are so demanding. So um, I've seen, uh, I know of three three approaches, Jay, or three facility approaches. One is, of course, a dedicated facility that is dedicated to long term care and licensed for long term care. And um, then there's a facility called a care home, which is a smaller home that can take five. To ten, perhaps five, five patients, 
and they're licensed by the state. And then there are foster care homes that are about three patients uh, permitted, and they do not need a license. So in that, you've got a whole range of quality of care that is representative, represented. Now, um, of course, we as Bristol Hospice and we, uh, and uh, uh, along with the facilities and the care homes are all under, under the uh, agency that does review and supervises and checks annually on our licensings. And so there's a, a good control factor there. And they do, really do a good job. They go into a facility and they'll make sure everything's in order. They look at this, the process of charting. They look at how people, uh, medicines are taken care of, how they're distributed, how they're disposed of. And, you know, some of these things that are back office for facilities that we don't even know go on. But, um, but so those get good, good um, control pieces in place. Um, as to, and the care homes uh, are subject well, well, to the well, same one thing. One of the problems, and I've seen this in friends yeah. of mine and friends of my wife and me, is that they're not only expensive relative to what a middle class retirement would uh -huh. yield, but there aren't enough of them. And there aren't enough quality ones at a reasonable price so that a lot of people you know, would be best advised to go to the mainland already. Yeah, There's no point in staying around here, banging your head on the wall, looking and looking and looking, and never finding. Um, it, it strikes me that we have missed the boat on becoming a retirement community. You can say we have a lot of retired people here. As you said, you know, a good part of our population is retired. But the truth is, we, we could be a retirement, major retirement industry, given our weather and our aloha and all that. True, true, um, so true. I, what I don't understand is why developers true. cannot yeah. make a buck and do not therefore build senior yeah. homes. We don't have enough senior homes in Hawaii now. Good point. There are a lot of folks who do stay in home, and one thing that we do in terms of when you get to the hospice point is the hospice care goes into the home. So we do a lot of home care enabling families to take care of their beloved, their loved ones as they go through this end of life process. And Medicare funds that. Uh, Medicare funds hospice care whether it's in a facility or in, in the home. We don't, Medicare does not fund the facility. That's Medicaid. That's that, okay. But that doesn't enough, that's not enough to actually pay for it. Though. Not all of them, no, by any means. Yeah. But, I, but I think you've, you've hit on a really good point, and that is how do we shift, make a cultural shift that says we are a devoted to a good retirement culture where people are, we, we recognize that people come here to, to live out the last years of their life, or they're committed to it in a healthy way. And that's where I want to come in, too, as being uh, a supportive of people who want to, um, want to really make this a glorious time of their life. And I, I have two ways of looking at this, Jay. And one way, I, I was on the East Coast for a while and flying over the Appalachian Mountains, and at one point, I flew to Asheville, North Carolina, and it was... It's a beautiful city. It's really pretty, and the, and the mountains there are gorgeous, of course. And there's a lot of rain, and we came in over a cloud cover and storm cover, and the pilot came on and said, folks, we got storms beneath us. We can't go in yet. Um, I'm looking for an opening, and then we'll go in for a for landing. So he, we, we cruised around at the, above, this, um, above the storm line, the storm area, and... Finally, he came on and said, I see an opening, let's go. And we went, wow, just went, dove right through that cloud cover and in, onto, the, uh, onto the tarmac available. And it, it was just a fast and furious descent. Some people live their elderhood lives like that. I'm going to wait until the crisis comes. No, I'm going to play around, cruise up here like I don't, don't have any problems and just take it when it comes. It'll cross that bridge when I get there, and then they get that disease, or they get that crisis that you mentioned, and they know they've got to go zoom right down into the into the uh, last, sometimes the very last days of their life. But I don't mean to scare, put a scary because it can be dealt with, and we do deal with people that way in the hospice care. But I also see you can come into Honolulu. You can start out way out here. And your approach, the approach to elderhood, and way out over the ocean and get things planned, look at things 
that are important in preparation and glide right in onto the onto the uh, RMAC. Glide right down, you know, a careful landing. Yeah. Um, and th that actually reminds me of taking a break. We're going to glide into a, Very a, little, good. a little break here, and uh, we'll be right back in one minute. You'll see. Excellent. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Walter Kavai. I, uh, I'm your host for our monthly uh, live streaming video uh, entitled Ukulele Songs of Hawaii, where I bring on guests. We enjoy talking story about the music industry here in Hawaii. Uh, sometimes going back uh, 50 decades, if possible, and uh, always having some good fun talking with entertainers. We're here located at ThinkTech Hawaii, downtown Honolulu, at the Pioneer Plaza building, and uh, in their studios. And so join me next month for Ukulele Songs of Hawaii. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Back with Larry Grimm. Uh, he's uh, the chaplain at uh, Bristol Hospice. We're talking about aging, aging in grace. Um, does uh, life begin at elderhood and how to age one day at a time? You mentioned before we, we took the break, Larry, that the idea was to, to have a graceful, mm, good experience in your aging process. Right. And sometimes your aging process is, is a degenerative process. You know, you don't get younger. Sorry to say, <clears throat> I wish there was a solution on that. Modern mm -hmm. medicine may change that. You know, like the deacon's chariot, they give you a pill that says, you know, you're going to last 100 years, and at the 100th year, your 100th anniversary, bingo, you're dead. Uh, <laughs> that was the deacon's, it was a poem in the 19th century. I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so what is aging in grace? Let's, let's That's find great. different scenarios. Aging in grace in a senior facility, what do you see as the ideal arrangement? Well, we, we talk, the implication is that we can get everything external is going to do everything we need to have done. And we really do pour a lot of good attention and resources as a society into doing what we can to provide an environment for elders. Uh, some of them prefer to, to stay at home and die at home, and we'll get to that later. But, um, but part of what I want to look at, Jay, with people is the internal life. Um, what goes on internally, and what can we do internally to help make this a glide path, at, start out here rather than start right at the crisis of moving into some other facility? Because well, they're prepared. They know what's going to happen, exactly. and, and things will not you know, be as much of a cold shock as they might be. That's exactly what I'm thinking, Jay, and that's yeah. exactly what I mean. Um, and I see that there are five basic tasks. You know, Eric Erickson took out, uh, did a lot of work with psychosocial development, and he identified tasks that were imperative to be done at different stages of life, eight stages. Uh, he got to elderhood, too, and he, I think he was not there yet. He didn't really understand it thoroughly. <laughs> but, but I take that stage approach, and I'm working with the stage of elderhood. We have childhood, we have adolescence, we have adulthood. I want us to have a wonderful... Elderhood, and there's it's it's a task. I mean, it's a, a concept that's being latched onto since since the '90s, the past couple of decades. So, in elderhood, and what I've observed is that the the kinds of things that demand our attention internally in elderhood are five. One is um, grieving. Grieving. I'll come to. I'll come back to him. The second one is sorting out. Sorting out. Third one is forgiving. The fourth one is preparing, and the fifth one is letting go. Now, can I give you a description of each of those? Sure, but I'll tell you the truth. They all sound uh, self-explanatory to me, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy they do. Yeah. yeah, I think they're well, well chosen. Well, thanks. Well, grieving, of course, we, we get to this stage of life, and especially we baby boomers, 
I mean, we've been accustomed to having everything we wanted. You know, we don't, we're not accustomed to having to give up things. And, um, and so grieving becomes suddenly a, a thing that we're involved with far more than we ever anticipated. Uh, and I think that grieving takes, takes community. It takes a, somebody can help each of us and help us to move through this. Um, to get over the pain of loss and the loss, some losses that are so great, they, you know, you, and you've mentioned some of those already, but some losses that are so great that we think no way we can ever recover from those. We'll talk about that. Second thing is sorting out. Uh, I hear people sorting out their stuff. Uh, people have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and when you go to sort out your stuff, Every piece you pick up says, oh, I remember this. There's a story there. And you're sorting out stuff according to the story it represents. And um, so in we'll, we'll, sorting out, I focus on what people's stories are. Who am I? How, how have I become the person that I am now? And if there's, a, there's probably a story that you like to tell about yourself way back when. And the story is different contexts, different tasks. But when you tell that story, your face brightens up, your, your, your body shape changes. You feel it right now. And, that's, that, and we sort out those stories. What are the stories I want to keep and keep telling people about my life? Because every time I tell it, I experience it afresh. Well, they define your life, and they belong to you. They're special for you. They're your personal story. Beautiful. <laughs> They belong to you. That's all right. That's right. So they're sorting out. So the third thing is uh, forgiving. There seems to be, my mother called me a uh, Sunday night, one Sunday night. She was not healthy, and I knew that. She was living in California. I was in Denver. Hi, Mom. Larry, I'm so, so she says, I'm so sorry when I get on the phone, get you on the phone, I start talking, and I don't really see how you're doing it. And please, I just feel so bad about it. Said, Mom, what are you talking about? She said, well, I just wanted your forgiveness for that. And so. Yeah, I forgave her and hung up. She died Thursday. She had some desire to have that forgiveness. It meant nothing to me. I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't thing that kept me uh, angry. Uh, but I mean, I'm sure it meant something to you. Well, I, I mean, the fact that she started talking when she came on yeah. online. So it was just something had to be cleared, you know, for her. I have another story about forgiveness that's really dramatic, but... Um, so the fourth thing is preparing, and this is where I think getting a uh, knowledge base about the externals is very important. But we have a social worker at hospice, we have a, a liaisons, we have a, a care, um, uh, an RN care person who manages care. We have uh, chaplains, I'm, I'm one of six chaplains there. We have uh, nurses' aides. If you know what's available in a, in a certain care system, then you can choose that and prepare to talk, talk to yourself about getting into it eventually. What's it going to be like? So preparation is important. Legal, legal matters, you know, um, sure. making sure everything externally is prepared. But there's an internal preparation. And, and I think that is, what is the, your belief about that life beyond life? There are four basic stories. No easy answer on that one. Well, there are four basic stories in human history. One is the lights go out, you turn out, you leave the building, and that's it. The second one is you join your ancestors, and you enter into wherever they are with them, and you're reunited with ancestors. The third is that you live on in the legacy of people who remember you on Earth. In Kenya, there was a village that said, as long as somebody in our village remembers you, you're still alive. Yeah. And fourthly is to join with the eternal, or with, uh, uh, with the creator God, yeah. and to live in harmony and, and oneness with that God. Yeah. So those are the four basic stories. Here's another story. Oh. The Rainbow Bridge. Ah. You know my meaning. For that. For you the are pets. rejoined with your most precious beloved pets. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. more than... <laughs> It's more than, more than ancestors. <laughs> they were always nice to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. May I, I always... So I hope you unpack these 
all these stories. We will. And then the fifth thing is letting go. Ah, uh, right. Thank and you. the fifth thing is letting go because um, so often I've heard I'd be outside in the hallway and the daughter comes out and says, you know, mom just doesn't, is not doing well. She needs to die. She just won't let go. And I thought, just won't let go. Of course she won't let go. It's not easy to let go. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross said, you know, when somebody dies that is our beloved, we're losing that person. The person who's dying is losing everything. Everything that ever right. made. So it's the will to survive. It's it's primary primary will. Exactly. So, exactly. And you have to you know give that up. Exactly. So so those are the five elements, and I and I'm, I want to structure my my program, the show here around those five elements, those what I call spiritual ta emotional tasks, and uh, we'll keep referring to those and have have visitors, people, guests that come on and share within the five elements. Something of their insights and knowledge. I, yeah, I'd like to see you do that. I'd like to see you unpack each one of those things and connect them because they're, none of them are in a silo. They all touch the That's other a good point. Now, yeah. It, yeah, that's yeah. a good point. So, I mean, but some people are, you know, they're, they're out of it. <clears throat> and it's very hard to have these conversations. And it's very, you know, even to the point of letting go, they, they have no idea where they are. Uh, they're, 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 out, they're beyond that. What do you do as, as a hospice chaplain? <clears throat> that's, that's probably the most difficult piece for me. When we, uh, when we receive, uh, particularly Alzheimer's patients, who, um, for whom their brain has shut, is shutting the body down gradually, and uh, they don't have any interaction at this point. They're not engaging, so I can't talk about meaning with them. Um, but what I do is two things. One is um, presence, just be a, a, a loving presence as best I can. And then the other thing that I do is sing. I'll sing for them. I'll sing songs from their past. I'll sing songs that I imagine they might enjoy. And we've learned that the, the, uh, the part of the brain that is responsible for music and poetry remains unaffected by Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. We, uh, we also have, a, particularly at, at our hospice, a Brighter Moments program, and we bring in an MP3 player that has earphones, and we can load that with uh, songs that the family, that mom and dad used to love these songs. Oh, that's great. And then they put on the earphones. And also touching, I expect, touching, uh, the warmth exactly. of another human being. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, we're out of time, actually, Larry. I'm oh, sorry to say there's so much more. Uh, and I hope that next time you also, or in the times to come, you also discuss, you know, the problem of uh, suicides, joint suicides joint among suicides. people, you know, couples, for example, who can't live without each other or yeah. who have no money left and cannot envision uh, the survivor surviving. Uh, and also, I'd like you to cover, if you don't mind, at some point in the show, um, the whole thing about... Um, about death with dignity and medical aid in dying, where that fits. MAID. Yeah, where that fits, because that, that's the law now. We haven't had a lot of examples of people actually doing that in the state. Uh, where does it fit in your analysis and sure. in, in, the, in the, way, the needs people have at this point in their lives? I come at this, Jay, as a, uh, as a chaplain, hospice chaplain, professionally trained. I also come of it, to it as a coach, a life coach in elderhood, and so I have opportunity and ability to meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, uh, either face-to-face -face or online, and do some coaching in their particular context. That's great, sure. Context. It's not just at the end of life. It's, it's, um, it's anybody who is thinking about that. They long, get that glide in. The long glide in. <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry. You're welcome, Jay. I feel younger. <laughs> <laughs> you look younger. <laughs> Thank you.